So one of the manufactured link we have is that we do have the living collection of plants of South Africa in these 11 gardens. So that in itself, it's like a repository, it's like a museum, it's like a, a, a place that if all else fails, if climate change impacts, it's a refuge for threatened species. It's a place where there's an example of the morph morphological type. It's, you know, that, that's the kind of rationale we've made. So the, the good thing about the gardens is that it puts us in the public space a little bit more. And I think that we would be competing with with academic institutions and other science institutions too much if we didn't have the gardens to ground us. So we still have scientists on our books that will have spent their whole life working on one family. That family of plant is neither economically valuable, even ecologically valuable, medicinally valuable, or even an indicator for climate change. I wouldn't have employed those people if I had a chance. Uh, so that we have got some of that. So that, that maybe if there was one change I would make. But I think that part of the strength of SAMBI is to have a bunch of people who are scientists, uh, but scientists who have to, had to be pushed a little bit to also be relationship managers. But there are that spectrum of science. You do get those ones who will, you know, um, focus on a irrelevant species. Not irrelevant. One shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean. Uh, and and totally feel that. For, for us to move you into a slightly different approach, even to another family, it would be dumbing down the science. And I, we do have a few of those. I hope that answers your question. Remembering that we started out as the National Botanical Institute. Thank you, Tanya and Selwyn, for very insightful presentations. And as you're speaking, I'm trying to project to our space where we don't have the history that you've just rightly pointed out of being grounded by the gardens, and yet you want to have an institution as effective as I think Sanbi has become. And so I have two questions, or maybe two and a half. <laughs> One is related, again, to partnerships that help you bring in the information you need, and yet you said you have legislation that requires you to put that information together, but you're not ma they are not mandated to provide information to you, correct? Would you think that would have been better otherwise if, if, if in the setting up of Sanbi it was by mandate that people would have to archive, share, or deposit the information with you? Do you think that would be a useful model? I'm trying to think in the context where there isn't like in Kenya, an institution with a history that grounds the development of such an equivalent. Um, I've always actually assumed that institutions had been mandated to provide information to Sanbi. So it's interesting and refreshing to hear it's the partnerships that have evolved that have done that. But you do have a history that gives you the credibility, the standing, the interactions from the past in the botanical world. So just your insights. Do you think it makes sense to have legislation that requires you know, as you can imagine, in Kenya we have many scientific institutions, some set up by government, some independent, some NGOs, and I guess the big question will be why should we give you this information? Why, you know, so I'd like your thoughts on that. Um, and two, you also said something about playing in the policy field but without telling policymakers what to do, so to speak, giving them the information and they do what they choose. How do you draw the line between either making recommendations or giving? policy framing without again sounding like you're prescribing because I hear you governments don't want to tell them now this is what you must do but yet again you want them to sort of think in a certain direction I haven't read the policy documents you have put out but um, I imagine you do have a role in recommending but maybe that's a thin line how do you define that line in 
framing that yet without prescribing. And my last question is to Selwyn on the whole value chain um, proposition for Sanbi in linking what you do with other development sectors. Have you found that you've been more um, reactive when development's happening and you have to say something because you do have something to say yet, or do they come to you at the inception of projects and say, we're thinking of putting a road through here. What are your thoughts in how the planning of that should, and you know, should reflect biodiversity concerns? Is it at the inception project stage or is it Sanbit discovers there's this development happening and we think we should say something before it goes too far? I hope that's clear. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Anna. I want to just respond to your last question. It's a very gray area. So when I first became CEO six years ago, we would be receive a lot of requests for information. Um, so NGOs would want us to join them anti this, or uh, somebody who wants, because we have got part of our National Environmental Management Act legislation, a public participatory process for greenfields development, for example. They'd want us to be part of a court case against. And I, just on my desk when I arrived was a whole lot of that. And, and I think that with the senior team, we very soon had to conceptualize our position to go beyond the gate of, into the policy arena, through the gate, gives us huge conflict of interest. If we are providing the data and scientific evidence and we are participating in individual projects, it's a conflict of interest. And as a state entity, we step back to the side of the gate. So for years, we would get requests and we would just direct them to our information. You information to build a bridge across the Kai River, please refer to our biodiversity GIS system, and there you can navigate and get all the information you need on threatened ecosystems, threatened species, etc., etc., um, so that we also allow our department to make the policy, to make the, the to, to give the the license for the after the environmental impact assessment because it's a very murky area. So you do want to make sure that you understand that firewall. Otherwise you become an NGO, anti-government, pro-government, in government's pocket. So you just stick with the science. But then science itself is difficult to interpret into a decision-making tool. So we've taken that little step further, right up to the, with our nose at the gate. Um, to take the science into tools. So one of the tools we just launched last week is a very contentious tool called Mining and Biodiversity Guidelines. And all, yeah, you, you know that issue here. Yeah. Just got it in my this morning. <laughs> okay. And all it is is saying, according to the fundamental biodiversity information we have on species and the information we've got on, eco on ecological uh, threatened states and the water information and the information we get from all our partners, we overlay them all, that there are some areas in South Africa that are no-go areas for mining. It's not a lot. It's like 10%, like 5% of South African on the ground. It's not, you know, you, you do not want to hug a lot of trees here. What you want to do is produce guidelines that is a doable guideline. So we're saying to the minister, where water is generated, where there are wetlands, where there are the, these are no-go areas, do not ever give anybody an, an EIA for that. Then there's a band which is critical area but needs mitigation. Then there's a ban which, which you could do whatever you want to do. And it, the, the irony of it is the mining sector welcomed this. 
mining sector loved it. The biodiversity sector appreciated it. The minister of mines didn't like it. So it was a very strange situation we were in. But luckily, our minister is, is, is quite a powerful minister. And she understood immediately that it was, so she just played the role of persuading the mining minister that to have certainty about where you can mine is better than to have no certainty and, and a free for all and all the political shortfalls that can come out of that. So we were, we were in the minister's very good book because she's got science to show where mining can, mining is a very big and powerful constituency uh, in South Africa. So when you talk about playing up to the gate, so the tools that we've developed, for example, one of the tools we are obligated to produce that's in the Act is the guideline for bioregional uh, areas. Sawan showed you some pictures. There's a, ma there's a map version and then there's more deeper information version. And th that tool now provinces use to make their, their provincial biodiversity strategy. We assist them to do it, which is another thing, another way of getting people not going into the policy arena, but assisting the technicians to understand the tool and therefore to persuade their politicians around policy. And that has also been good. We run two very big forums, which has been very useful. One is called the Biodiversity planning forum, which has been great for making friends and influencing people because they're quite junior staff in provinces. And we have a meeting once a year. We excite them with new things. There's a lot of production. Uh, it's a moment when the planning fraternity of the country come together and everybody looks forward to it. It's grown bigger and bigger. It's not an expensive thing to do. It really is worth your money doing that. Um, and the other one is the Biodiversity Information Management Forum, which Sawan runs, which also is among those tools are, are very useful. So yeah, we just play that. Partnerships. Frankly, I think for a developing country, obligatory legislation is something we should have. The argument being that if the information is produced with taxpayers' money, then there should be some obligation that that information be, be able to be analyzed further. Um, I could lie to you and say I've enjoyed the long journey of persuading everybody and egos and you know courting and all that. It was good, it made us have a relationship, but I wouldn't have minded a little bit more teeth around that. Uh, and Brazil, we were just saying Brazil has legislation around that. And our PIA legislation, which is the um, protection or a promotion of uh, access to information is very demand driven uh, rather than supply driven whereas the Brazilian uh, legislation is, 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 is supply driven. So for example, uh, if you're working in the Water Institute and you're doing work on water quality in Brazil, then that information comes to a, a repository where you can do analysis. But because we have taken the journey without the mandatory and done it really about proving ourselves as leaders, using, abusing that line in the act to make it mean more than what it is, basically, proving to our partners, going together to get money, being cooperative and not in competitive, we setting the agenda together. We've just developed the biodiversity research agenda. We do it together with partners. We don't do it sitting on a hill. When all of that has been a journey, uh, and so the relationship is much more equal. And maybe 
Maybe it would have been spoiled if there was a, a legislation. But I do think for developing countries where we have such a few resources in our sector, we're competing with so many other demands from the fiscus that we should find mechanisms to make us more efficient in that production. We're not a developed country where we can sit on a hill, work on the left leg of a frog for 10 years. It's, you know, we just don't have that luxury. We have to both be good and be fast, you know, be good, be brief, and be gone kind of approach to, to it. We just have to be. But I, I must say that if, you know, sorry, my partner here, one of our partners, it would have been a quicker journey in a way if we had the legislation. Maybe not such a, we might not be so friendly, but we would have been quicker. <laughs> you want to ask? Yeah, sorry. Just to talk about the, um, the mandatory approach to collecting data, I think what it will require also is um, having the infrastructure, the processes, and everything in place to be able to receive all of the data, because that's going to be a, a, a challenge to make sure that you're in a position to be able to do that. Um, what we are doing now is we are asking our legal team to interrogate the legislation to see whether SAMBI does have the right to do that. Um, and that's why we're looking at the issue of standards and, and Sambi's role in that regard, because at the moment it's all, it's all voluntary. So yeah, we, we'll watch that space and see what the opinion is that comes back to us. But I do think it will help a lot. And also I think over the past 10 years, Sambi has shown the value of collaboration in terms of supporting common systems because it reduces the costs and the skill space. Just also to touch on the issue of um, you know providing support to look, such as EIAs, Environmental Impact Assessment, SAMBI provides the same information to the private sector, to the consultant, as it does to the government official that will make the decision. The big challenge also is around the capacity of the non-scientific sector to interpret and apply that information for decision making that SAMBI will not make. We will not make a decision. We will not provide that type of service. I think it's, it's, as, as Tanya said, it's, it's going to be a conflict of interest. But there's a big challenge to make sure that the way this information in, is interpreted at decision making stage is correct. And that is where we're putting a lot of energy into it as well. And supporting local government officials. I mean, we've had requests of our major big, of big companies wanting us to provide a recommendation for an EIA. Just imagine Sambi does that for one. It opens up the floodgates. We get dragged into the court no, cases and everything. You know, referee and player, yeah, it doesn't want work. To, you can't do that. You just want to be the player, not the referee. And I think it goes back to the issue of, of providing scientifically defensible science, veracible, veracible science, that we very often do not have a case where the science is thrown out. You know, um, and very often the science is not in doubt. It's around weighing up the different options that's available. Interpretation is. Thank you. We're a little bit behind for lunch. Quick question. So the question that was posed was also very much around why would institutes provide their data to SANBI? And I've been quite actively also involved in getting data, moving it, or at least in the sharing of data and that process between organizations and SANBI. And one of the key things very much is, um, is, is collaborative work. Um, We've got the Biodiversity Information Management Forum, which is one way also in which we very much engage with our stakeholders and talk about the work that we are doing within the Biodiversity Information Management Directorate, not only in sharing the data, but also in how it's relevant to policy. So there are many sort of areas that we do elaborate upon. Also in institutes providing their data, they're not just um, providing or sharing the data, they also then become more involved around biodiversity information management. We've got lots of training events that we run throughout the year and often also when institutions do sign up to become a data provider with, with the institute, um, they also could get preferential access to training. So there might be many other benefits. They, they, there's their support, their support to those institutions when they do share their data sets. So, so there's lots of in-kind services also when these things do happen, when there are 
um, data sharing agreements put in place or when there is um, a new partner in terms of our managed network. So not only is there sharing, there's training and those things that people can also partake in. Um, and the Biodiverse Information Management Forum also is a big um, is, is quite an in, is an initiative in which we also enable our partners to be part of to harmonise data and to talk a bit more about the informatics work that we are doing. We've also make money available funding. Tanya mentioned funding for the last probably about five years. We've made approximately a million to 1.5 million rand available for data sharing, and those are really catalytic seed funding. And in many instances, with some of our institutes where we've provided a small amount of funding, there's been huge um, benefit in that. Um, you know, we might provide 50,000 rand to a small project and at the end of the day we might get millions of records and not necessarily just because of that funding but because of the relationship, because of um, sort of uh, the bigger projects that those institutes are involved in. So sometimes, like I say, the money sometimes does support the work but there's also much more in-kind things that happen in these relationships. Thanks.